Part of the reason I think demography is very important, at least if we're going to talk about the future, is it is the most predictable of the social sciences. And this is not just a, because some people will say it's crystal ball gazing. But actually, if you look at a population and its age structure now, uh, you can tell a lot about the future because the 50-somethings of the 2050s have already been born. Uh, so by looking at the relative age structure of different populations, you can already say a lot about the future. So that's part of the attraction of demography when it comes to forecasting. That's not to say it's everything, but if we compare it to weather forecasting about climate change or when we talk about the economy and economic forecasts, those are all a lot more hit and miss uh, than demographic forecasting. Really what the book is about then, it's a way of combining my interests in politics and culture with <coughs> demography. And it argues really that religious fundamentalism is going to be on the increase in the future and not just out there in uh, the developing world, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, but in the developed world as well. And many of you may have come across the book God is Back by a couple of the editors of The Economist, um, Micklethwaite and Wooldridge, who argue really that uh, far from disappearing, religion is going to be a feature of the 21st century. Um, However, part of, a large part of their book was devoted to looking at Pentecostalism or American influence forms of evangelical religion in the developing world, such as Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and to some extent, people who are of the belief, and, and many people are of this belief in the West, that religion, strong religion, is fading away. We're becoming more rational, uh, more sensible, and therefore religion is going to be fading. And there's a lot of evidence for that in the empty pews in Western Europe. Um, people will say, well, that's happening out there again in Latin America. That's where Pentecostalism is exploding like wildfire, or perhaps East Asia, but not here in the heart of the West. Uh, but the kind of phenomena that I'm talking about really are in the heart of the West, and their growth potential is strongest in the West. So this is really going to be about uh, the return of the religion in the Western heartland, not in the developing world. And again, um, John Gray makes this point too, that for many of us, we will say, oh yes, we'll tip our cap to uh, the resurgence of religion uh, in the Middle East or, or elsewhere, uh, but we don't really believe it's going to happen in our societies because we can see evidence to the contrary. We see Dawkins and Hitchens and we see uh, Anglican churches hemorrhaging members, um, and so we don't really believe it's going to happen to us. And, and that kind of ties in too with uh, a sort of Francis Fukuyama view about where we are heading towards a kind of liberal democratic endpoint, inevitably, which is liberal, secular, etc. And I think this book really is, is putting a question mark beside that. So what do I, what do I get into in terms of the argument? Uh, what I argue is a, a couple of points. First of all, in terms of demographics, there are two effects going on. One is, a, is an indirect effect and another is a direct effect. Both of these effects lead to the increase in the proportion of the population that is religious and especially the increase in the proportion that's religiously fundamentalist. I'm not denying that secularization has taken place, particularly in Western Europe and increasingly, by the way, in the United States. Um, so there's no question about that and I accept that, but I say you have to look at the countervailing force of demography because most people get their religion the old-fashioned way they inherit it from their parents. And so demography is an enormous impact when it comes to determining how religious a society is. So you can actually have more people leaving religion than entering religion at the level of the individual, but the society becoming more religious. So we know, for example, that more people leave religion for secularism in the world, but uh, the world as a whole is becoming more religious. Why? Because most of the population growth, over 90% of it, is occurring in religious parts of the world. Now, so getting back to this point about indirect direct, there are, the indirect effect has to do with global demographic forces. We are entering into a global demographic revolution. Only one aspect of this is religious. So 2050 is going to be uh, the apex of a process of uneven demographic transition. The developed world 
is going to be aging at unprecedented rates so that much of Western Europe, in much of Western Europe, 40% of the population will be over the age of 60 uh, in 2050, which is roughly a doubling of the situation today. In the developing world, by contrast, we have still got most countries that are in the earlier middle stages of their transition. So they are having, undergoing population explosion, very young populations. And those fertility rates, the birth rates, are coming down throughout the developing world. But it's going to take time. And 2050 is really going to be the peak of dissonance between the developed and developing world. So that's going to create enormous population disparities. We're going to see, even in 20 years, Ethiopia and Uganda will be bigger than Russia in population. And, and, and Pakistan will add you know, 100 plus million onto its population. And this is just the momentum of past um, high fertility working its way through the system. What that then leads to is a couple of things. The world as a whole, the secular parts of the world, which is Western Europe, to some extent, well, Western Europe and East Asia are really going to be aging the fastest. The religious parts of the world, uh, which are mainly the developing countries, are going to be growing. And the migration pressure is going to be from the religious parts of the world to the secular parts of the world. Um, and so that, we're going to see a replacement through migration of secular populations by religious populations. That's an indirect effect. So that's not happening because people in sub-Saharan Africa or the Muslim world are having lots of babies because they're religious. That's not what's happening. They're having lots of children still, although those rates are coming down, because they're poor or rural or have low the women have low education, all of which are changing. Um, so they're not actually having large numbers of children because they're religious, but as a byproduct of the fact that the population growth is occurring in these developing regions that happen to be religious, that's increasing the religious share of the world's population and leading to this desecularization. Um, now, one could make the argument that when the immigrants come to secular societies, they too will become secular. Uh, part of the reason I think that's not going to happen, there's a couple of reasons. One is, the most important is that even secularization theorists like Steve Bruce will admit that when uh, a group enters a society with a different ethnic origin to the host society, their religion can find a new lease on life. So it finds secular work to do. So being Muslim becomes a marker of your Bangladeshiness, for example, to use a, a, a British example. So that then insulates Islam from erosion because it becomes accepted and encouraged to be practicing within a, the Bangladeshi Muslim community. So as part of the way of marking out your ethnicity, you lean on Islam as a symbol. So it gains uh, secular significance as a marker of ethnic identity. So that allows Islam to insulate itself. It doesn't work as well for uh, West Indian and African Christians, which is why we see actually significant uh, religious decline in the second generation for West Indian and African Christian immigrants, but not for Muslim Sikh or Hindu immigrants, or, or mu Muslim Sikhs or Hindus who have almost perfect retention into the second generation. Um, so there's no evidence of secularization amongst the non-Christian immigrants in Western Europe, or very little, except for a few examples, such as in France, and I can get into that, reasons for that. But the second part of my argument is the direct effects of religious demography, and here, um, the paradigm case are the ultra-Orthodox Jews, of course, who have, I mean, if you take the case of Britain, 17% um, of observant Jews in Britain are ultra-Orthodox. Three quarters of the births in that community are ultra-Orthodox. And that just shows you, and that's a factor which simply reflects the three to four times higher birth rate of uh, the ultra-Orthodox compared to, say, reform and conservative in, in this country. And so by 2050, we'll see a majority of Jews in Britain will be ultra-Orthodox. In Israel, already a third of the first grade class in the Jewish sector is ultra-Orthodox, up from a few percentage points in 1960. That the massive changes that are going on uh, in Israel, in the Israeli population, and which actually have all kinds of political ramifications, because then the ultra-Orthodox population is spilling over into um, occupied territories where the new towns are being built. So now the, the ultra-Orthodox parties have a stake in uh, opposing the peace process. So you have all these sort of knock-on effects of these demographic changes. I also want to emphasize that there have been many cases in history where demography has mattered, and mostly in ethnic conflicts. Um, and we can look at Northern Ireland, the decline in the Protestant share of the population, or Lebanon, uh, 
the Christians declining from two-thirds to a quarter of the population in 50 years. Um, and that actually has had huge political effects. So people who say, well, demography doesn't matter, I, I would say actually it depends on the case. Sometimes it doesn't, where you have assimilation that dissipates that demographic energy, but in many cases it does matter. Uh, and I'm arguing we can take this model of direct religious fertility, which is people having more children precisely because of the holy text, go forth and multiply. Uh, traditional gender roles, women should stay at home. Uh, and contrast that too with the secular attitude, which might be encourage you to find yourself, to develop your career, or might encourage um, sort of individualistic attitudes or modern gender roles, all of which would actually delay the age of first birth and reduce uh, the level of fertility. And we find, in fact, in all countries of the world, even when we control for education and income, um, that religiosity of a woman is a significant predictor of fertility. It's just a question of how significant it is. So the attitude of the ultra-Orthodox, which is this direct relationship between religiosity and higher fertility, we see that in, uh, in Islam, we see it strongly amongst the Salafists. Uh, in the Muslim world, we find, for example, um, that in urban areas of the Muslim world, where contraception is more available, there isn't a need to have children to work the land. There we see that value choices are increasingly important to determining family size. So women who are most in favor of Sharia law have twice the family size of Muslim women who are least in favor of Sharia law. So this is within Islam. My argument is largely within religion, within Judaism, within Islam, within Christianity. It's not about Christian versus Muslim, Protestant versus Catholic. It's not that argument. It's a within religion between fundamentalists and moderates or seculars. There's this gap. And that's a steady fertility gap, which is directly linked to um, the relationship between religiosity and fertility. In the US, uh, the most, there are a couple of cases which really jump out at you. One is the Anabaptist sects, the Hutterites and the Amish. Uh, again, uh, these are sects that largely close themselves off from mainstream society, like the ultra-Orthodox, geographic segregation. This enables the group to maintain the children, which is very important, because if you had lots of kids, but they all defected to secularism, you have no effect. But by setting up boundaries against the secular world, you minimize membership loss. So membership retention has been going up in most of these religious communities. And at the same time, you have um, very high fertility against the backdrop of a world in which fertility has been falling in the Western world below the replacement level. And eventually, in the whole world, we're going to reach that point, supposedly, uh, in the second half of the 21st century. So in a world of falling fertility, where family sizes are dropping below 2.1, against that backdrop, um, thrown into relief are the fertility rates of these religious groups. This is part of the reason they're growing more rapidly than before. The other part of the equation demographically is simply uh, the fact that fertility has become much more under our control now. Uh, when everyone was in the countryside and you had high infant mortality, you had no access to contraception, you needed children to work the land, those were all good, sound, material reasons to have as many children as you could because who knows how many would survive. They were very important. With modern medicine and sanitation and contraception, and urbanization, all of a sudden that's taken out of the equation. And so we have this literature called second demographic transition theory which says um, increasingly fertility is a choice and therefore values matter more. Are you secular? Are you religious? Are you fundamentalist? That's going to count for more. That's why we're not all Hutterites or Mennonites now. Um, it's partly because um, a lot of what I'm talking about has really only emerged in the 20th century, especially post 1960s. Even the ultra-Orthodox you can see their geographic segregation increasing in the 50s and 60s in Israel. It uh, wasn't really there before. They weren't segregated. As they segregated their losses, the children were retained much more effectively. Um, and so it's a combination of factors that are going on, modern factors. And that's why it's happening now and hasn't happened in the past. Um, I, th I then in the book go on. Uh, I trace through the demographics. I look at another movement in the US. I mean, the Amish and Hutterites have been around for a long time. They have become more geographically segregated. But these are populations, you know, if we, if we look at the Amish, they were 5,000, I think, in 1900. They're a quarter of a million now. Um, the doubling time of the population has been sort of 20, 25 years. 
Um, and in a situation where retention rates have gone up and general fertility of the U.S. population has gone down, that's going to make a bigger imprint. Now, these are still small groups, uh, but in Israel, the ultra-Orthodox are a much bigger group, will have a bigger impact. Another interesting group uh, are the quiverful Protestants, so sort of neo-Calvinist movement in the U.S., which is a, the person who uh, is sort of the doyen of the movement is Doug Phillips, who's the son of Howard Phillips, one of the founders of the Christian right, um, converted Jew to evangelical. But Doug Phillips and the whole quiverful philosophy is really about God as the family planner, and God will determine how many children you have, no, no birth control, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So your family's of 15, and you have uh, women breaking down in tears because they've only got three or four kids, and they can't have any more, and they think God hasn't favored them. And, you know, so you have, and, and this movement, what's different about the quiverful movement, too, is that they have explicitly said, we have a 200-year plan for domination based on high fertility, whereas the ultra-Orthodox have high fertility for reasons, you know, they believe in traditional gender, gender roles and so on and so forth. It's somewhat indirect, whereas with Quiverful, it's very direct. Um, I then say, well, if we, if we look at this movement and the impacts of this movement, what are, what are the effects on politics and culture? And I say, well, we could make the argument that this then imperils or at least questions what we expect uh, modernity to look like. Uh, it may not turn out the way we expect. Um, and John Gray, of course, is very good on this. He argues that, in fact, it might just be an accident the last 250 years, uh, that, in fact, we could see things swing the other direction. Simply because, and, and demography could be, it could be argued um, that demography might be one of the mechanisms that derails this sort of end of history argument. I mean, Fukuyama's argument was, say, he said, well, look, I know that classical historians, Polybius, Cicero, uh, Ibn Khaldun in the Muslim world have always talked about barbarians who had stronger social cohesion, um, stronger demography, sacking decadent individualistic societies. But actually now we have advanced weapon systems. We can keep the barbarians out uh, and we won't have this endless cycle of uh, social cohesive Goths and Vandals sacking uh, decadent Rome. But part of what, what my book argues is in fact it may not be guns blazing from the outside but rather a sort of slow hollowing out from the inside whereby the sort of difference between the socially cohesive and the individualistic is expressed through demography, through different family sizes, and through changing, a change in composition of the population. And I kind of explore it. I won't talk for much longer. I think I'm running out of time. Um, just at the very end, um, this issue then of, of demography leading to cultural change. Um, and how we should deal with it. And it's not, an easy, it's not an easy question for liberals because if you clamp down, uh, you know, sterilization or, or you know, geographic segregation, you violate liberal <coughs> principles. And so that goes against your beliefs. But if you don't clamp down, you may endanger your own civilization as well. And I don't have an answer to, uh, to this problem. I think part of what's happening is it's in a context of the exhaustion of the great secular religions socialism, for example, or anarchism, or even secular nationalism, uh, such as Arab nationalism in the Middle East, the, into that vacuum, uh, the end of these ideologies has moved religion. And so I think part of the context is the exhaustion of these other emotionally appealing ideologies. But anyway, I will Just leave it there. Yeah. Sort of can, yeah. can I just ask you, because the, the, the thesis, which is often people will be familiar with, is the idea of the, you know, the Islamic takeover of Europe, the Eurasia right. thing. Okay. Could you just just pop in a word yeah. about that, because... So, so I, I, I mentioned the book's largely about the shifts within religion between seculars and uh, fundamentalists. The Eurabia argument, Chris, you know, if we think about Caldwell's, Chris Caldwell's recent book, which is actually, I think, quite a good read. It's reflections on the revolution in Europe, and it's looking at the, this increasing Islamization of Europe. My argument is there is going to be an increase of Islam in Europe. Um, it'll, it's going to be more on the order, if we're talking about 2100 even, I don't think it's going to get beyond 20% in most Western European countries for a number of reasons, one of which is that the Muslim birth rate has been coming down very swiftly in the Muslim world and in Europe. Uh, the second reason is the growth of Hindus, Buddhists, and other non-Christian religions. As they grow, they make it harder for Islam to take over. So, but my argument is really it's going to be fundamentalism within Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and that there may even, we may even see cooperation between these faith groups. 
on particular culture war type issues. Uh, this is kind of the political argument I make. And if you look at the United States as an example, for 130 years from the 1830s till Kennedy's election, the real battleground was between uh, white Protestants and white Catholics in the North. So in the Northern states, white Protestants went Republican, white Catholics largely Democrat. Ten, not 10 years later, all of a sudden, you get a shifting of the axis. The ethnic question, or the, the faith tradition question, Protestant Catholic, is turned on its, on its head. And all of a sudden, it's religious Protestants, traditional Catholic, getting together on issues like abortion, uh, on issues such as um, gay rights, for example, uh, perhaps even on the issue of evolution. And you have this new split which cuts across faith traditions. So you have conservative Muslims, Christians, or conservative Muslims, evangelicals, Mormons, Catholics, Jews, and even, um, I think I've counted them all by now, uh, but <laughs> against their secular opposites. So John Kerry is a Catholic, but most, almost all traditionalist Catholics go for George Bush the Protestant. So this is where you have this ethical uh, values dimension cutting through the old ethnic religious tradition dimension. And I think we can see that even internationally, cooperation in fighting the United Nations family planning and women's reproductive rights initiatives. We've seen cooperation between American evangelicals, the Vatican, uh, Sunni Islamists, uh, Iranian Shia Islamists getting together and planning strategy. So I think there's a lot of scope here for um, this kind of values politics to emerge, particularly as conservative fundamentalist groups within all the major faith traditions grow. We can see you know, a conservative party, even in Britain, in the future, perhaps saying, well, it's a better strategy to go for a morally conservative agenda where we can get the conservative Muslim vote as well as the conservative Christian vote together into a coalition, much as the Republican Party goes after the conservative Hispanic vote and the uh, conservative evangelical and Mormon vote and tries to make a coalition there. So I sort of explore some of those political ramifications as well. But I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for asking me, uh, Laurie. And um, actually, um, I have some fellow feeling with your father because uh, I'm an unbeliever, but I married a Catholic. And I feel rather left out because I didn't have any of that fire and brimstone stuff. <laughs> and uh, the sure. word contraception was never mentioned, either in favor or against it. Um, so maybe things have changed a little bit. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be able to respond to Eric, because I think his book is a, is a fascinating and important one, and I think there's been nothing quite like it, um, which is not easy to do these days. Um, and the, to look at both religion and demography together uh, is a very important exercise. Um, and I was very struck. I mean, the first page of the introduction says, this book argues that religious fundamentalists are on course to take over the world <laughs> through demography. Um, which uh, I, I thought, well, you must be very depressed and, um, you know, you should be taking sedatives or something. Um, and I, I think it's quite a dangerous remark to make in all seriousness because while you are a nice liberal fellow, um, when people talk about Group X is going to take over the world by breeding, it's a very, it, you get into very murky and dangerous territory. And we, we saw this really in the, in the 60s with the kind of population control freaks, almost all of them based in, in Washington think tanks there, who basically saw the Asian hordes, the black hordes, these were primitive people, and they were about to wash over us. And, and American culture, European culture, was going to be destroyed by these primitive hordes. And there is a danger in this sort of argument that you're perpetuating the same thing, which I thought was very unappealing and actually had some horrible consequences, mostly in India. And uh, while I don't accuse you, and I wouldn't dream of accusing you of having this, there is in this argument sometimes a mixture of what I would see as fear and contempt. And I think it's a very dangerous basis for any argument, if, if that's the way you think. So I think that's a warning that I would like to start off with. I think there is also a danger um, of this sort of straight line thinking. If people are having children at such and such a rate now, it will carry on indefinitely. Here's the graph, compound interest, we're all doomed. Um, and, you know, mathematically, of course, that's correct, but I don't think it works like that. And I think, in fact, you hinted at it several points in your, in your book, Eric. I mean, there was a time when the Catholics of Northern Ireland were seen to be, you imply, bog trotters breeding without control. 
the, the, the fertility rate of Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland is now the same. And in North America, actually, the same. There was a lot of anti-Catholic feeling in North America by the Protestants. They were said to be primitive rabbit breeders. And again, the, 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 the birth rates of Catholics and Protestants in North America are now virtually identical. Not for want of trying by the Vatican to push it back the other way. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, but the fact is, it didn't happen. And, and Brazil, perhaps, which I, I guess must be the world's most populous Catholic country, the birth rate in Brazil has fallen dramatically. It's now just about replacement level in Brazil. Fascinating thought. And yet, because of the power of the Catholic Church in Brazil, there is no state fertility planning, uh, family planning at all. In other words, you know, one can overestimate the power of religious zealots, even among those who might believe in some of the fundamental tenets of what those religions say. Because they might say, well, yes, I do believe in God, and I do believe in the Holy Ghost, and I do believe in the Holy Spirit, but I don't believe in not taking contraception. You know, that's a perfectly legitimate position, and that's, the, look at Italy. I mean, the population is, is cascading downwards. Um, Poland, perhaps the most, again, the most Catholic country, I would think, in, in Europe. Population dramatically declining. Um, and by the way, here's a possible solution for your problem of the, of, of the sort of, what about the secularists? A friend of mine is a Swedish woman, and she says, why is it that, the, that in Sweden, where I come from, there is a higher fertility rate, and we're, you know, not religious people, than in Poland and Italy. And he, she says it's because they're all chauvinists. And that in an, in an, area, in, in an era when women want to work, want to have jobs, if the males are ultra-chauvinist, the women go on birth strike because they can't manage it. Whereas in a country like Sweden, where she claims the men are more enlightened, um, it might be more reasonable for a woman to have children. So the answer is, you know, you secularists out there, you, you men, you've got to be more like new men because, because actually then your wives or partners will be more inclined maybe to have more than one child or maybe more than no children. Um, because actually, you know, it's, it's a relevant point because your book does not really contain, you know, you have this thing, oh, we're going to be taken over. Well, you know, people might say, well, Eric, so what's your big idea? What's the solution? Are you going to put bromide in the water supply at the Vatican? I don't, you know, so, um, you know, it, it, that's one possible way out. Because, you know, the solution, if you're talking about demographic imbalance, solution may not be saying, well, how do we stop all these religious people breeding like rabbits or whatever the word of the day is. Um, it's, well, what about us? You know, because the imbalance, by definition, if there's an imbalance, there are two sides to the imbalance. And if, you know, if, if people who are secular are not breeding, well, that's part of the imbalance. And, and I would also say, going back to my point about um, the danger of using these arguments of um, a whole group, a whole class of people being somehow undesirable, shouldn't breed uh, as much. I mean, imagine if it was turned around. I mean, imagine if religious people said, you know, we think that humanists, their thoughts are so dangerous, they really shouldn't be breeding. You know, I mean, you'll be very offended and rightly offended if, 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 if because of what you thought, that you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't be breeding. And I think that uh, the, the other argument you make uh, in the book, although you didn't quite touch on it here, is the environment. That there's a danger that uh, we use up the Earth's resources far too much if we breed too much and, and look at them all. Um, because it's quite interesting, because the, for example, the Haredi in, in, in Israel, I mean, they, they're non-consumers. I mean, for start, they don't use electricity on Saturdays. They don't drive cars. You know, the Amish do not drive, they use horse and buggy. I mean, they're outside modern materialism. Um, they're probably the least consumer-oriented, least avaricious in using the resources of the earth than any group of people you could possibly come across. I mean, in some ways, it's kind of quite scary how you know, non-materialistic they are. Um, I think also, uh, you rightly say in your book that there is a kind of grip that religion can have, which has been underestimated by some philosophers, like Daniel Bell or whatever. Um, and that, th I'm sure you're right about this. I'm sure that metaphysics is always going to be more attractive than physics. And actually, for those of us of a non-mathematical bent, much easier to understand. Um, and uh, I think that something which addresses the question of exactly why are we here and what happens afterwards is always going to be immensely powerful. And, and I think, yes, secularism has, has a problem. But I, I, I do prefer the modern form of secularism. When I mean, you mentioned the gods that failed, in a sense, you mentioned communism. Um, when you think, what, what was the, one of the horrible lessons of the last century was when you had 
Because man has a capacity to worship, a desire to worship. And what happens when that desire to worship attaches not to something up there, invisible, but a real man on earth, whether it's Hitler or Stalin? It, that is really dangerous. And we've seen the consequences when that desire to worship at, at, is, is attached to something which is not spiritual, but which is based around nationhood, race, or whatever. Um, and therefore, you, when one looks at China, because uh, you mentioned uh, the book by Micklethwaite, God is Back, the most interesting part of that book, I thought, was that it said, what is the country in which religion is growing fastest? What country is it? I don't know if anyone here could hazard a guess. Christianity, in fact. China. China, exactly. People's Republic of China. Um, now, I'm actually, I'm not a religious person, but when I was young, I was quite worried by the thought of these billions of Maoists, these billions of people who believe that whatever Chairman Mao said is right, that was what we should do. And, and it, it, was, it was a scary thought for someone of my age uh, growing up. I am less worried by the thought that there are going to be hundreds of millions of Chinese who do not automatically obey what the Communist Party says, who are Christians, who probably therefore have a more internationalist perspective than if they were simply good members of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, because I, I do think that religions based on race or political party, which is what they often are, is actually more dangerous, and I think the last century showed that, than religion based on a kind of metaphysical ideal. And, and finally, I would, I would um, like to just address the point you made about these religions coming together. I can see why you might be bothered by that, but actually, traditionally, what would worry secularists, I think, is what happens if the Muslims attack the Catholics? What happens if the Jews attack Christians? You know, the, you would see these, these religions as violently antipathetic against each other and that you would have wars of religion. And I think you, you therefore should not be quite so worried, perhaps, if they seek to make accommodation with each other and say, well, we believe in certain things together, which means they're less likely to fight over land or territory than in the past you would have expected. Um, but as I said, I would, I don't know whether, um, Eric, you want to uh, sort of come back to the lecture, but I would be interested to see what you're offering by way of solutions. I mean, what you're saying should happen because if, if you're just saying oh well we should be very frightened they're going to take uh, take us over take over the world and there's nothing we can do about it um everybody in this room is going to be very depressed and so if you could do something to to, to cheer them up a bit <laughs> i think it would be most welcome thank you I just give uh, just if you could just make just one brief response and then you know, two, if you just want something that you're longing to pick up on that uh, oh, just for a minute or so. Okay, I mean, there's, there's so many good points there, and I, I, I don't know where to start. I mean, I guess the Protestant Catholic, it's funny, there's a sort of Catholic-Jewish commonality here, since I'm sort of half Catholic, half Jewish, or secular Jewish, I guess. Um, this question of, of Northern Ireland, because I have done a book on Northern Ireland, so I do know something about it, and I agree that there is there was this fear of Catholics outbreeding Protestants, but part of what I'm saying in the book is that that was largely grounded in tradition, in the sense that the Catholics were earlier in their demographic transition, they were more rural or poor or less educated. As they became all of those things, uh, their fertility came down, and it's the same as Protestants would. Whereas in the case of, say, ultra-Orthodox versus secular Jews, these are actually gaps that are stable or rising, part precisely because the ultra-Orthodox they're not going to be affected by rising prosperity or education because they've set their face against those modernizing trends. So I think there's a difference there between the kind of between religious faith tradition and the within tradition that I'm sort of identifying. Uh, also, I think it's worth saying, you know, you say that these things may not come to pass. And you're right, there's a lot of guesswork in some of these projections. But still, I mean, we can look at, if we look at the rise of the ultra-Orthodox in Israel, or, or even in this country, or we look at the fact that sort of three quarters of the growth of white evangelicalism in the 20th century was due to higher fertility rates, actually. So that has made a huge impact in terms of politics uh, at state level and also nationally. I mean, if you look at the shift in rhetoric um, in, the, in US politics, the fact that you can't really be elected anymore if you don't have a, um, if you aren't really religious. Um, and so 
I do think we can already see, and finally just, uh, I think there are some pernicious effects in the sense that, you know, if you look at the Muslim world, um, you can see that the influence of Islamism has, it's not so much going to be about violence. I don't believe that religion is more violent than the secular religion, sorry, that you mentioned. It may be less violent, but it's more about uh, restrictions on freedom of expression, minority rights, and so forth. The sort of cultural puritanism, that cultural agenda, which in the Muslim world has really prevailed, even though Islamist political parties haven't really won many victories. Um, they have really pushed the cultural agenda towards Sharia. So I think that's quite a dangerous thing. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I just, uh, a couple of questions I'll just ask, if, if I may, and then we'll, we'll come to. I just want to say, because I think probably, uh, Dominic, the question is, one can perfectly well say, why do we need to worry quite so much about these fundamentalist groups? I mean, there were plenty of fundamentalist groups in the past that we sort of like took a fairly benign attitude towards, and they're not going necessarily <laughs> going to destroy society. But the some of the arguments about this, the concerns about it, are about the end of the Enlightenment. They are about, as it were, the way in which fundamentalism or the, the, the increasing power of fundamentalism isn't just about people's spirituality and getting on with it, but also about, you know, it's about the, 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 the insertion of creationism into educational systems. It's about the idea of using, um, of a sort of irrationalism. Uh, which is going to become extended and that the idea is the Enlightenment is going to fall prey to these new fundamentalist groups who are anti-scientific, who are anti-rational. Well, I mean, someone might be a creationist, but his car will still work in the same way. His computer will still work in the same way. I mean, he is a creature of a rational, reason-based society, whether he knows it or not. Yes. <laughs> but, but, if, but, if, but, but I wonder if, to what extent, when you're talking about the fear, what, what might happen as a result of alliances between groups. For example, just take the simple area, say, the scientific teaching uh, or the teaching of evolution in schools. I mean, this is a sort of hot potato with something that's going on in the States. It's something that has to be almost fought for now. But one can envisage a time in, say, 10, 15, 20 years when groups that can combine together and adopt a creationist standpoint are going to change the educational well, I, agenda. I, I think what is certainly true is that the, the will, there will be a breakdown in the state's grip of education. Um, I'm not that worried by it. I mean, if, if I was a teacher, I would be more worried by the attempts by the state to, to, to decide exactly how I teach, what I teach, every half an hour of the day. I mean, most teachers I th that I know of actually resent the kind of centralization uh, that successive governments, I mean both this government and the previous Conservative government, have brought in. And if the price of, of a greater small l lib liberalism within the education system is that there are some people whose children will think that we were created by God in seven days, um, it's not something about which I panic, frankly. Um, and, and, and again, I just, I just don't, and it may just be... Um, you know, if we were to kind of false options on my part, but I just don't believe in this idea of the sort of ineluctable incrementalism. So I don't believe, for example, that in my lifetime or shortly afterwards there'll be no Japanese, no Germans, and no Italians. But if you if if you thought that demographic trends were somewhat ineluctable and inalterable, that's what I would have to believe, and I don't believe it. I just want to uh, yeah. uh, just put one to you, then we'll then we'll sure, come sure. and take some questions to the audience. But it's uh, I, I'm just. When you talk, you talked about um, the ways in which high fertility was associated with, if you like, geographical segregation and, 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 and insulation to an extent. I mean, if you're looking at Europe at the moment, I mean, presumably if we're talking about uh, Islam here, we don't have this type of uh, segregation. I mean, insofar as one can find areas which are predominantly Muslim in parts of Europe, but it's not as it were a closed wall. It's not bounded in the way in which say, uh, Jewish Orthodox communities are in Israel. Uh, yeah, I think that's true, partly because most of the, uh, most European Muslims are sort of from traditional, uh, a traditional background rather than a fundamentalist. So it's not been a large number of Saudis with a strict Wahhabism have come here. So because of that, you're, you're right, that there is, it's still quite loose. However, I think within the Muslim community, you have this polarization between the more, Salafist or the more strict Wahhabi type Muslims who are more segregated and have heart large. So I still, it's, I suppose Islam is the religion where you see the dynamic I'm talking about the least. 
but it's emerging quite strongly. In Judaism, you see it the strongest. Christianity is somewhere in between. Um, but in Europe right now, no. Uh, most Muslims would be traditional or moderate and therefore not segregated in the same way. Yeah. Again, I'm, I'm trying to think a little bit of solutions because I mean, um, uh, you know, I have a sort of morbidly practical cast in mind. But, but uh, it's something again you didn't touch on your book. But um, welfare. I've seen w why why is it possible for the Haredim to grow at such a rate in Israel? Because the welfare system permits it. Okay, they don't have to serve in the armed forces, which others do on, as a matter of conscience. Uh, they can. Basically, all Haredi men, up to at least the age of 40, do nothing but study the Talmud. I mean, this is paid for by the taxpayer. It is paid for through the welfare system. You have a situation in this country where y you have polygamy for Muslim British citizens, and the, the welfare system does not say, oh, well, you can't have lots of wives, and you know, we won't pay for it. It, it says, no, that's okay. So I'm, I'm just saying that um, it, it, I'm interested that you never advance this as, as, as a possible solution, a change in the system of welfare, which, by the way, the secularists, as you would know, if you meet secularists in Tel Aviv, um, that's what they want, because, of course, they're bitterly opposed to, the, to what's going on in Jerusalem. Right. Quick, quick, well, quick. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I totally agree with you, and I think that they should, um, you know, withdraw those, those privileges as quickly as they can. Uh, and I, I don't disagree with you that, that the welfare state could be used, but I don't think it's really going to do it. I mean, if you look at Haredim in, in North America or in this country, yes, their, their birth, you know, fertility may, be, may, may not be at the sort of 7.5 level as in Israel, but it's sort of 5 to 6, and the changes are just almost as rapid. So I'm not sure, I mean, it may make some difference, but I'm still not convinced that it'll make a huge difference.